Now, in the book of John chapter 14 where we read, Jesus was deliberately inform informing his disciples of a new regime in the administration of the economy of God that was about to be unveiled. In this new regime that is about to be unveiled because you need to understand the dynamics of the regime in order for you to prosper from its peculiarity. In this new regime, the Jesus that used to be very visible, the Jesus that was bound to its single location per time was going to become invincible. And there was a need for Jesus to occasion this transition effectively in the experience of his followers so that they will be able to understand how to function within the context of the new regime that is about to introduce. For instance, you know we read the book of Acts chapter 1. Are you with me? Stay with me. We read the book of Acts chapter 1 for instance. And you know I said that verse 3 was my emphasis. The Bible says it was seen of them 40 days. There was a 40 day period between the time of his ascension, the time of his resurrection, and the day of his public ascension. Even though in between the moment he rose from the dead, he spoke about going to appear before his father. So I want to believe that it was his father that granted him the request of having a 40-day period to interface with the functionaries that he was going to commit the enterprise of the kingdom of God to. And what he did within... You are now with me. Ah. Stay with me. What he did within the period of the 40 days was that he... He would just appear and begin to lecture them about the things that pertain to the kingdom of God. Then he would disappear. And the reason why he was doing this appearing and disappearing was that he wanted them to know that he was as much with them when he was invincible as he was with them when he was visible. Because he was trying to orchestrate the transition. Oh my. See, in the book of John chapter 14 where we read, he began to talk about the regime that will be obtainable in the economy of God when the visible dimension of Jesus was no longer available. But what he was trying to achieve in the book of Acts chapter 1 was the gradual departures that will make them comfortable with the fact that even though they could not see him he was readily available to them in the person of the Holy Ghost that we cannot interface with on the strength of our physical senses. But he opens to us a gateway, a gateway to tap into the resources that are fully captured in the person of the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost actually did not come to accomplish his own mission. The mission that the Holy Ghost came to accomplish is to make the throne, the office, the ministry that Jesus is accomplishing in the heavens, to make that office efficacious. So in keeping with that reality, when the spirit of truth comes, he will not come to speak of himself. It's that which he shall hear. That is what he will bring. It's like a PA system. A PA system, a microphone cannot just begin to talk. It is what you send into the microphone that it passes across. It amplifies it. It makes it powerful. It makes it audible to people that are beyond the reach of your human voice. So there was a transition that Jesus was trying to orchestrate. A transition from the visible Jesus to the invisible Jesus hallelujah I'd like to show you a, a ceremony that took place in John chapter 
20. But before we do John chapter 20, I would like to us to pick some of the substance that can be found in John chapter 14 where we read. First thing that Jesus said is that if you love me, these are parting statements. So when I was with you physically, if I ask you to do something, you will do it. Now there's going to be a test of your love. I will no longer be in your company, in your midst. And the proof that you love me is that you do what? Keep my command. If you are dealing with the invincible Jesus, the proof that you love him is that you keep his commandments. So the proof of love in this new regime is obedience. Just like the proof of trust in this regime is dependence. So Jesus begins to enlighten his people. When he was physically present, there was nobody that could refuse him. If he should say, do this, they would do it. But he said, no. If you love me now, then keep my commandments. And when I see that you are diligent keeping my commandments, which is the proof of your love, then I will pray the Father. There is a request I will make to the Father. And this request will be triggered by the fact that you love me and your love is revealed in your obedience. I, I don't have time to walk that scripture because of our constraint at the moment. Then I will show you, I will show you how that it is easy for you to speak in tongues and still disobey God. I will show you that obedience is something that is intentional. You, you don't stumble upon it. I will show you that obedience is something you need to pray about so that you can practice. The moment you wake up and you say, Lord, I want to obey you today. I want to do just what you want me to do today. You will realize that before you close from work to come back home, you would have insulted an Okada man, insulted his ancestor. You would have almost fought twice. Because suddenly the devil will be interested in your flesh. When you didn't pray that prayer, you were, you were modest, you were calm. But the moment you say, it is my wish to obey you. Satan will reveal to you an aspect of you that you are not aware of, which is the flesh, the flesh. It is a seed that the serpent sowed into the existence of our first forefathers. And the power of that venom is still in every man. The moment you say you want to obey God, then Satan is going to activate that venom. That venom that will want to make you respond to situations and circumstances according to the flesh. Meanwhile, Jesus said, if ye love me, do what? The, the basis of his government over your soul, I mean Jesus, is love. If Jesus wants to make you his captive, what he will do to you is that he will lavish love upon you until you feel a sense of responsibility to reciprocate it. If you have not come to that point, you will not be responsible because even the scriptures acknowledges that there are believers that are unreasonable. The moment you start becoming reasonable, seeing that Jesus gave his all to purchase you, then consecration will begin to mean something to you. Except you come to a point where you are willing to obey him as a matter of duty. It means you don't love him. And love for him is a platform upon which he entrenches the capacity of his government. A Christian without that is operating outside of the government of God is a loose canon. 
it is still under the rhythm, the influence of the rhythm of his flesh that he will still be functioning. But when you know that you have something with God, the kind of statement that Peter made, he says, silver and gold we do not have, but such as we have. Peter was saying, I have something with Jesus. And on the strength of that which I have, I can spend from it so that you can receive your miracle. When you start having something with Jesus, then you begin to take obedience seriously. Because, of, because you love him. There is a love connection. You can't see him grieved. Because you want to avoid every form of grief that is, that is, you are capable of triggering. You will avoid several things. It means that his hold on you is becoming firm. And the reason why it is so for you and not for the next person is because you, you love him. So others can do what they want, but me I cannot because I love him. These are instructions he gave to people that he was going to depart from. The first thing he said to them was, what? Yeah. I hope you know once upon a time, Peter failed the principal love test and he denied Jesus three times. One of the things that Jesus did when he rose from the dead was to orchestrate redemption to Peter's soul. So, are you with me? You're not with me. For every theologian that is here, it is my opinion that the book of John was supposed to end in John chapter 20. And I need to tell you why. Become, don't, if you are a theologian, don't fight me yet. Wait. Calm down. Calm down. Can we start from, are you there? Sorry, don't worry. I'm watching my time. The moment I believe, ah, I'll just stop. Then we can continue tomorrow as the Lord gives us the grace. Can you do John chapter 20 quickly? First of all, before you start this study, let us go to John chapter 1 and find out the subject of the book. Are you with me? You know, when a book starts, there's, there, there, there's things like introduction so that you understand what you are likely to get from the book. Alright, so let's do John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse number 1. John chapter 1 verse number 1 says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and I hope you know in the entire Bible there are three times you will find in the beginning one of them was written by Moses that's the beginning of creation the remaining two was written by John. Right? John saw further into the eternal past than Moses. Because he spoke about a time. Are you, are you with me? I hope you know our God doesn't dwell in time. He dwells in eternity. So in order to get a reference point for God, your reference point for, for God is contingent upon the insight he gives you into the past. And John saw the farthest into the eternal past and he said that in the eternal past was a personality called the word the logos this personality called the logos is actually the compendium of the purposes of god he is an embodiment of everything that god wants to do he is he occupies an administrative capacity so if the council of the Godhead wants to achieve something, this is the administrator that pays for it. That goes to do pro procurement. This particular person was there in the beginning and this person was God. Exactly. Now, so the subject of the book of John is an investigation into that personality that is called the world. 
that correct? All right. So it, it, uh, at this point, uh, John is trying to attempt to explain this person, this person that is called the Word, as the Word. It's impossible to do that. But when you go to the next verse, it now tells us that it's this personality that is the Word that created all things. It suggests to us that when the Father made decrees, let there be light. There was an actual civil engineer that went down to make what the father said come to pass you will see some of his activities in the book of genesis chapter 2 from verse 5 to 7 he is the personality that the king james calls the lord god jehovah elohim in genesis chapter 2 the one that stepped out of the quadrant of the trinity to come upon the face of the earth to do actual mold modeling and god formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the Lord God, that person was the that's the pre incarnate identity of this personality called the world. You are, not, you are not with me. If you want to investigate this personality from the perspective of what he created, there is no end to the taxonomy of the things he created because even till now, in fact, last week they just discovered a new species of fish last week. Last week. So you cannot exhaust the things he created. So the things he created he can by no means define who he is. Then John now steps down his research again because he brought it to the creative mode of the world. There's no end to that. He still stepped it down again. He said, In him was the Zoe. And this Zoe. Was what? In him was life. And this life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot. So John got it there. Because the only way you can study this personality is from his life. Are you with me? Meanwhile, if I take you deeper into the book of John, I will show you 18 things that Jesus did that no mortal can do. There were 18 advertisements to show that Jesus was actually a creator from the beginning. The God that was never created, but is in custody of a kind of life. This kind of life that is in custody of is uncreated and it cannot be destroyed. He manifested those dimensions 18 times in the book of John because the book of John is the book of life. The investigation that is done in the book of John is about his life. The book of Matthew talks about the kingdom and sees Jesus as a king. The book of Mark reveals that if God's purposes will be forged upon the face of the earth, he needs to give his servants a body so that you have something to possess. And Jesus was given a body and his father possessed him. And everything that he did was the will of his father. In him, God was defined. The book of Luke is the book of the universal grace of God that shows us the capacity of God to save. Whereas in Mark, he is the slave of God. In Luke, he is the son of man that stands on behalf of the human race so that through him and what is done to him, divine justice can be satisfied. But the book of John is the book of life. And John is actually studying the life that Jesus has as a means of understanding him and his purpose and his mission. Exactly. Now, having understood that, go to the book of John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, are you there? Quickly, John 20. Can we read verse 30 and verse 31? Please don't forget why I'm doing all of this. I'm trying to show you that John chapter 21 was not supposed to be in the Bible. And then I will show you why it is in the Bible. And many other signs truly did 
Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. This is a conclusive statement. The book was already completed. See, there are many signs he did though, but they are not involved. They are not in this compendium. Exactly. Oh, you are not with me. Oh. If I had known that you are not with me, I won't come here. I'll just, I have two scriptures and then we'll go home for today. Go to verse 31. Quickly. He said, but these are written, the ones that are written in the book, are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Are you with me? This is in conclusion. We have now discovered who Jesus, that word that was made flesh, we have discovered him. He is who? The Christ. That is his ministry that is running now in the heavens. He is in the capacity of the Christ. It's an office. It's a ministry. So, see, Jesus is the one that occupies the office of the Christ. That's first discovery in the, the concluding chapter. Those of you that have written projects, you know what we are talking about. This is conclusion. Jesus is the Christ. The son of what? God. That's not all. And if you believe in this Jesus, you will have the kind of life that he had that was responsible for those 18 features. That he manifested in the book of John. Is that clear? Is that clear? So this is the book of life. There are tales of life I can tell you about the book of John for 21 days. Each day we come, I tell you a tale. 21 days will not even be sufficient. Just the book of John. Because it's the book of life. It's everything written in this book. It's written so that you can know that he is the Christ. One, he's the son of God. Two, and if you believe in him, you will have the same life. This is conclusion. Go to chapter 21 verse 1. Where's my... He said, after these things, that's after the book has finished. <laughs> Jesus showed himself again. There was no need for him to show him. They were at the printers. They were about to roll the book out. After these things, the book was concluded. Then he showed himself again. But if you check 21, you'll see there's no new doctrine. There's no new message. But why did he come back? It is because Peter had backslidden. Peter had gone back to fishing. Meanwhile, before he left, he said, if you love me, do what? So Peter had lost his love for Jesus. And he remembered where he kept his net. He didn't burn it. So he went and recovered it. And was going back into to, to, to scale up his fishing business. And Jesus had to orchestrate a simulation. The kind of experience he had on the day Jesus met him. He toyed throughout the night, he caught nothing. So when he went to labor this time again, Jesus ensured that he caught nothing. Maybe his mind will now reflect. And the Jesus, are you with me? Jesus appeared, stayed at the beach. Jesus had fish. Three fish, not so many, three. The guy labored and came back. John said, hey, he's the Lord. It was John that recognized Jesus. Peter did not. He waited for him, he came and he was boiling, roasting fish. He didn't address John. He didn't address all the other guys. Meanwhile, the moment he said, I go a fishing, all the apostles followed him. His, his backsliding tendency was going to cost Jesus the entire enterprise. So Jesus had to appear again. It was not on schedule. He came back, put three fish on the on fire. So when Peter came, he asked him something. And he asked him thrice, according to the three fish, love it thou me more than you. He did that three times. Notice that Peter denied Jesus how many times? He had to restitute his deniers three times two. Three fish. You know why? 
it is needful for Jesus to know that you love him if he's going to be invincible. That was why Jesus punctuated the book and made an appearance again just to ensure that now this is functionary truly loves because if you don't love him when he becomes invincible <laughs> so the first thing that had to be achieved is that we must know your heart of love for Jesus it is your heart of love for Jesus that makes you take on the burden of sacrifice without feeling it it's like a, an anesthesia the burden of service to Jesus is heavy but it is not like a burden to you it's like a privilege the moment you lose that love quotient it will become so difficult for you to do it because you begin to rationalize it and Jesus needs to know if you love him that's the first thing he had to do in his marching orders before departure he asked them please help me ask your neighbor love it thou Jesus more than whatsapp please you were not so bold let's start again love it thou Jesus more than Facebook most of you wake up early in the morning the first thing you touch is your phone meanwhile the first place of all things must be given to God you are wondering why God is far you don't love him If we are going to deal with the invincible Jesus, we need to solve the love problem. That's number one. Number two. He said, when I notice that you are loving me, meanwhile, according to the book of Songs of Solomon, I can show you 12 levels of that love. 12. When you walk on the twelfth level, this world can no longer call you their own. They know that you have found something that you are in love with. Have you found somebody? Maybe in your secondary school, you saw someone that was in love with marijuana. There is no physics you can teach that person. You see, because they, they love. They are not here. <laughs> the love for weed surpasses any form of knowledge you want to communicate. It will not work. If you really love Jesus like that, at a point, it will become like a drug. It is only in that state where you are hypnotized by his love that you can say, leave the kind of job I was, I was doing. You understand that? My last salary was 1.2 million. I was going for a crusade and Jesus, Jesus said, when is your passport expiring? says expiring on the 28th of September 2020. He said your job also expires that day. You need to be drugged under an influence for you to leave that job. That I was two weeks away from the exam that will qualify me to become a management staff. And by God's good, good grace, I don't fail exams. <laughs> Hallelujah. By his good grace. <laughs> two weeks away he said it has expired you need to be my colleagues thought that someone from the village had finally succeeded on my life in the hotel where we are supposed to gather because they will camp everybody there you are not going home again until you write and fail or you write and pass everybody reported it was only me that was absent and they had to call me from that place say pastor because they thought I, I went for a crusade and for God. Said, no, I didn't forget. I have resigned. I've... They concluded. They said, we don't conclude today. Something they follow this man. The question is, do you love Jesus? Because that's the only way he will have a hold on your soul to manipulate you. When you are about going astray, and he, he, he allows you sense that he will be grieved. That becomes the handle 
through which he can call you to order if you have something with him that is affectionate that is passionate that is private that is there are four meanings of love according to the book of songs of solomon it is affectionate it is private it is personal and it is hidden people cannot understand the reason for your choices it is rooted in the fact that you fell in love and the full cost outline of the love relationship that christianity is that is supposed to graduate from one level to another level to another until it reaches its ultimate terminal is enshrined in the book of songs of solomon it might start in an affectionate manner but it will journey into the sacrificial corridor it will actually lead you to the altar of sacrifice it is more more brilliant when you have decided to be sacrificed that's when you can let go your battles your fight you have something with your brother you want to you can let go you can allow people cheat you because of god you can allow people trample upon you because of god you are it's not as if you have lost the skills of your hands your hands are still healthy but there's nothing to give your hands command because your heart has been captured many of us don't don't journey long enough you just come and check and say this is what i this is what i it's in depot and you stay at the periphery you will never know the depths of the kingdom of god into which we have been translated you will never know and how much poverty there is in the body of christ today i mean poverty of the reality of god ministry in our time has been reduced to marketing and management and customer care it's an enterprise that runs with a business mind and the economics is a critical factor you can do that in the name of ministry when there's no law but the more you navigate with Jesus the more your path becomes narrow until the options are no longer very many when you are like that people can take advantage of you like if you marry a wife that is carnal seeing that your options are not many say, uh -huh. because he knows you won't fight not because you lost your skills but someone captured you here and it is in the interest of your love relationship to allow yourself look like a fool it's human beings that thought you are a fool but in before him you are a champion so you can afford to allow people to to judge you from the perspective of their carnality meanwhile you are brazen in the spirit I choose to be brazen. I choose to be brazen in the spirit. 